As I've mentioned the last couple of weeks, I talked to a lot of people who claim to be believers in Christ, but seem to have more defeats than victories. They are constantly recounting the details of their latest trial, latest hardships, or their latest burdens. From their perspective, the enemy is always on the offensive, and they are always on the defensive, struggling just to survive and make it through another day. I see this quite often, and it's sad. It should not be. There are millions of people who have been deceived in the worst possible way to quite literally spend their entire lives being subjugated by an already defeated foe. A foe who has been completely beaten and spoiled by Jesus Christ himself. Today, what I want to share with you is the victory, yes, victory, that you have in Christ today, right now. Not sometime later when you get to heaven, but right now, today, in this world. And by seeing this, you will not need to live another single second in defeat. You will no longer be held hostage by a powerless enemy any longer. Welcome to Thriving Branch. I'm Jim. At the time of this video, it is two days after Christmas. We're heading into the new year, and people always make New Year's resolutions. And I know many Christians who make religious New Year's resolutions. But what I want to show you today is how to live in victory, not only for today, but for the rest of your life, into this new year. Wouldn't that be nice to start the new year off in victory? And that's what we're talking about today in this study. As I mentioned, I speak with people quite often who are still living in defeat who spend each and every day being beaten down and held captive by a completely powerless foe. This happens because of nothing other than deception and lies. These precious people have been deceived to believe that their victory has not actually happened yet. They're still waiting for it. I talked to many believers who think that their victory is going to come later. They've been taught that their victory will only come after they leave this earth and are taken up into heaven. Many Christians believe that, that they're still waiting for their victory. They believe that this world is still under the control of the devil. Maybe you've heard that before. Maybe you believe that. Maybe you think that you're powerless to do anything about it down here. Many of these people that I speak with do believe that. So they just wait and suffer every day until one day they'll finally have their victory up in heaven. That's a lie. And this lie is so very damaging and deadly because it has resigned literally millions of people to a weak and defeated existence. When Jesus has in fact given us power and victory, and he wants us to make use of it now. If you simply take a step back and think about it for a minute, 
there is no need for us to have authority and victory up in heaven. Have you ever stopped to think about it? There are no enemies to tread on up in heaven. There are no gates of hell for us to storm up in heaven. No, my friend. The conquering and the storming that we are to be doing over the enemy is for the here and now. So that we can set as many people free of the enemy now and today. But as mentioned, because of the lie, millions are not doing that. They're just sitting by and waiting as helpless people, letting a defeated enemy walk all over them, and actually telling others how they are constantly being beaten down and getting sympathy for it. Do you see how destructive and evil this lie is? How, do you see how it's destroying lives? Well, today it stops. So let's not waste any more time. Let's see what the scripture says. Starting with 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 53 through 58. Turn there now and read this with me if you can. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 53 through 58. Ready? One, two, read. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, when most people read these verses, they immediately think of the resurrection that's going to occur in the future. That's how I heard it all of my younger life as well. We immediately assume that whenever we read these verses, and I'm sure we've heard them many times in the past, whenever we read them, we always assume that it's going to happen in the future, that this is talking about the resurrection. But if we just assume that, we're missing something huge. You see, Paul uses this same language of putting on things, like putting on incorruption. He uses the same language of putting on in many of his letters. And specifically when talking about our victory and putting on incorruption, I believe we have missed what he's saying. Let me ask you a simple question. When do we put on incorruption? Have you ever stopped to think about it? When do we put on incorruption? Most people, without even thinking, would just assume that it is the resurrection. However, I want you to stop and actually think for a moment. Who is the incorruptible one. That's Jesus. When did you put on Jesus? When did you put on Christ? Ah, and that, my dear friend, is the point which I would like us to consider. For example, Consider the following verses where Paul uses the same language. 
Romans chapter 13, verse 14, says, But put you on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So we can see from these two examples that putting on of Christ is not something that happens later when we get to heaven. It's not something that we wait for, but it's something that happens in the here and now as we believe in and on Christ Jesus. Furthermore, we read this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit to unfeigned love of the brothers, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which lives and stays forever. And now, the connection is made even more clearly. We have been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, that's Jesus again, who lives and stays forever. Even Romans chapter 1, verses 19 to 23, speaks about the idolaters who exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for their idols instead. So with this understanding, returning to our verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and looking at verse 2, we see this. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. This is a reference to the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 25, a prophecy which details the redemption of God's people, which naturally was fulfilled by Jesus on the cross. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus, the fulfillment of the Old Covenant, and the ushering in of the New Covenant, death has been completely swallowed up in victory. We have died with Christ and are raised with him as new creations. That's Romans chapter 6, verses 8 through 11. This is something that we are to account as being done now, not something that we are still waiting for. And this is the key to it all. The enemy, who has already been spoiled and defeated by Christ himself, that's Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, that enemy who has already been defeated has very cleverly used deceit to cause people to subjugate themselves to him in ignorance because we don't know who we are and we don't know what Christ actually accomplished for us. Jesus has given us the best possible gift. You know, Christians love to say that Jesus gave the best gift. We talk about that at Christmas time usually. When everyone's got gifts and presents on their mind, we always say, Jesus is the best gift, you know. Jesus is the best gift. But do we know what he gave? Many of us don't recognize it. But Jesus has given us the best possible gift, himself. He has given us his incorruption. This is why the scripture tells us over and over again, in a bunch of different ways, to put on Christ. That we are one with him 
We are in Christ. You probably hear that phrase used a lot. Christians love to toss around the phrase, in Christ, but they don't know what it means. The scripture literally shoves it in our face again and again. And we still find ways to miss it and ignore it. Because mainstream Christianity has forgotten this essential truth. And people are dying because of it. What does it mean to be in Christ? What is the gift that he gave? Well, it's himself. It's his incorruption, which we are to live in now. Not just wait for it in the future. Now is when you need it. So in closing today, let's examine the final three verses of our text from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and see what this victory really is that we have and how to avail ourselves of it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 56 through 58. The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I've mentioned this before, and just as an aside, notice what the strength of sin is is it's the law that is the old covenant law of Moses we have largely forgotten this important truth as well most church leaders today will try to curb sinful behaviors by preaching more law and they're actually making sin stronger every single time they do that because the strength of sin is the law. The solution, dear church leaders, is not more law. The solution is more Jesus, more of his grace. It is the mercy, the goodness, the grace of God that leads people to repentance. Romans chapter 2 verse 4, Psalms chapter 130 verse 4. Furthermore, look at what verse 57 of our text says. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Instead of complaining about all of the things that the enemy is doing, it's time for us to realize that we have the victory. And how did it come? We didn't earn it. We didn't suffer for it. We didn't buy it. He gave it to us. And since we didn't merit it, we didn't earn it, that means we can't demerit it either. We can't unearn it. Now, very important, notice the channel by which the victory comes through our Lord Jesus Christ there are a lot of people trying to self earn their victory and blessings by trying to work for Jesus trying to earn his favor but again he gives us the victory as a gift. It comes through Jesus, not for Jesus. And this just solidifies our point. Your victory comes through Jesus when you actually put on his incorruption, which if you recall, 
happens when you actually believe on Christ and what he has done personally for you. Putting on Christ is a personal thing. The moment when you truly believe and receive the sacrifice of Jesus for you personally, that is when you put on Christ. When you can truly look in the mirror and see yourself as forgiven, righteous, and holy, not because you are such a good person, not because of your behaviors, not because of your performance, but because of what Christ did for you on that cross. Recognizing that it was actually for you. The old you is dead and gone, and you are now a new creation in Christ. And all that is included with that is yours. That's when you put on Christ. And this flows right into verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Once you realize that you are God's beloved, be steadfast and unmovable in that. Don't let anyone or anything move you from that place of being God's beloved. Don't let anyone move you from that place of peace in Christ and the reality of your status in him. Don't ever let anyone preach that out of you either. Many will try. Be always abounding. Be always filled and overflowing in the work of the Lord. Notice, this is not your work. This is not your efforts. This is not the work of your strength or your skill or your intelligence. This is the work of the Lord, which again is from the previous verse, the finished work of Christ on the cross. And know that your labor is never in vain in the Lord. And real quick, in closing, what is our labor today? Do you know? Many will tell you that this goes back to your efforts. Many will tell you that this, again, is your work, your strength, your efforts, your performance, and they try to bring you back to the law. But, but they have forgotten what our labor is. What is our labor today? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11. We labor to enter his rest. To stand against the lies of the enemy and bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. And again, notice that it is not our own obedience. It is the obedience of Christ. Do you see how this all revolves around Jesus? This all revolves around his finished work. So I encourage you today. You have victory because Jesus gave you himself. And he gave you his own incorruption for you to put on right now, today. There is no reason to wait another single second. Put on Christ today. Enjoy the victory that Jesus bought and paid for you to have. 
And I say this with all sincerity. Be blessed.